are 95% confident that that is the case. So this is what it means to, um, to construct the interval. Now the question, yes, uh, there's a question from Frank. Yes, good evening, Dr. Terry. Karibu. Yes, I was asking, uh, how did you arrive to the to those limits, 2.86 and 3.04? Oh, okay. Yeah, so this at this point, thank you for your question. Thank you. At this point, I was I just gave some illustration. Eh? Yeah, as uh, just some numbers to work with because we're introducing the concept. Eh? Later now, we'll, we'll do, we'll properly compute one. So for now, I gave just as an example. So okay. the two, yeah, I, including the 2.95, I just say we let, but when it comes to proper questions, we can now address and compute those intervals. Uh, and by the way, when we do regression analysis in second last chapter, you will always see these confidence levels and I will exactly interpret for you what they mean. So that as we look at uh, the regression coefficients that you do in any model, they will also uh, give you the lower and the upper limits for which those values will fall in. And we will be able to see. That's why we're introducing the concepts at this stage. Um, later on, they will make sense. Now, how large or how wide, how narrow is your interval? There are three things that will determine the narrowness or wideness of the interval you've created. So one can say the one, the example I gave you, uh, in the previous slide, which is a 2.86 to 3.04, um, it could be a narrow or a wider range depending on these three variables. The first one is the sample size. In uh, quantitative research, sample size is very important because as you increase the sample size, remember in the previous topic, we said that as N increases or as you increase N, you tend towards achieving normal distribution. And so, those, those are desirable properties for statistical analysis. So the larger the sample, the narrower the confidence interval you will create. So if you have a very small sample, then be sure you will construct very wide intervals. So the wider the interval, it means that you are, not, you are losing out on some accuracy. So you can imagine if you have an interval of student marks, uh, you want to say maybe the average lies between 40% to 60%. That is not very useful because that 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 wide that range is so wide. It means that you are you cannot be able to, to really measure your average properly. Partly it could be because you have a very small sample that you're working with. But as you increase the sample size, you may find actually that the, the range now, the, the interval will now become it narrower. You may find you may find it 52% to around 57% or 56%. So which is a bit narrower compared to the one that you've gotten before. There's also the variation within the data. You may find that the data you've collected, the sample, because of the nature of the sampling uh, practices and characteristics you've used or the sampling uh, strategies you've used, you find that you have a very diverse kind of a, a, a sample, which means that there are very different numbers in, the, in there. So if the sample depicts very high variation within the values, then your confidence level, why or confidence intervals will be wide. So the example for the mean GPA, if you only pick 20 students and you have extreme numbers, including those with lower and high GPAs, so your confidence level uh, interval will be very wide. But should you have maybe, if you picked properly your sample so that your data does not re uh, reflect very high variability, then you are likely to have a smaller uh, interval. Part of this could also be related to the sample size. And then also the last one is the sample, the level of confidence you choose. In statistics, we often refer to the 95%, 99% or 90%. So depending on which of the confidence level you choose, then uh, you will either have a wider or a smaller uh, or a narrower uh, confidence level. In most cases, the higher the confidence level, like for the 99%, you will get a wider intervals. So we can as well, we can try out. Because even the questions I'm gonna, we're going to, going to work with, um, even if I tell, if I propose you do 95, you can as well do with 99 and see what happens. Yeah, see what happens. 
So this is just a recap slide, which I think I will, I might want to skip for now. It just summarizes what I've said, what I've said. Why do we create confidence levels and intervals and the rest? Because we just want to get these um, uh, ranges between the range between the lower and the upper values. But I would like us to also note that those numbers that you get, they also give us information about the probability that the constructed interval will lie between the smaller and the upper limit. So it can as well be seen in terms of the probability. So for instance, why, why I'm bringing the probability is, let me go, allow me to go a few, one or two slides before um, and talk about this one. You know, if you can now say for this example, we've computed that, that the true GPA will be located within uh, the interval 2.86 to 3.04, 95% of the time. So you can as well say that the probability that the true population mean GPA will lie between this and this is 0 0.95. So this 95% can as well be interpreted as a probability. So the probability that the true value of the population will lie between the lower and the upper limit is 95% or 0 0.95%. So that is the message for the protection purposes. Good, having said that, then I think we are now almost ready to work with a few numbers here and there. Yeah, so the confidence levels usually come with some errors, some bias in some sort. For example, um, if you've gotten from a sample the mean is 2.95, you will have to include a margin of error because of uh, different things. Samples differ. You, if I had hundred people doing the study, then many people will not. They, not everyone will use the same sample. Not everyone will use the same uh, methods. Some are more. Some some researchers are more keen than others. So because of those errors, the margin of errors is what we will need so that we can now create the interval. And as such, this is dependent on the level of. It depends on these three variables you see here. So what I'm saying here in short is the mean GPA of 2.95 that we got from the sample will lie between a small value, I mean, a value above and a value below. So this is what We talk about as the confidence level, but we shall tweak it around instead of referring to the 95, 99, and 90. Now we will look at their, we'll look at them as critical values from a normal distribution. If you remember what we did last week, the normal distribution, we have these uh, critical values that we, we spoke about corresponding to each of them. If this is 95% confidence level, so it means on this end, I have 2.5%. On the other side, I have 2.5%. And so the interval that you've picked here, if it's 95%, it will now tell you what is the error at the end, what is the uh, remaining section on the other side. If I do 90%, it means that my, uh, my confidence level now will be somewhere narrower, so 90%, meaning the rest is 5% here and 5% on the other side. So the question is the margin of error will be determined by which of these intervals you choose. But however, because we cannot use the 95, the 99, and the rest, we consider their Z statistics. <clears throat> Sorry, this is what we spoke about last week the critical values at each of them, at each of those levels. And I think we were able to read from, I don't know that we were able to read from the Z scores, but last 
today I'm going to also show you an easier way of getting them. Um, I know some of us are not very comfortable working with those tables, the tea tables and the rest. Uh, it, it's good for, for knowledge purposes, but I'll also give you a different way of looking at it, of uh, working around those confidence levels using uh, using maybe uh, Excel functions and the rest. I'll show you how you can quickly get those numbers without necessarily going back to these tables. Then the next thing is the standard deviation, which is the sigma up there. So, so this is sigma. Sigma represents the standard deviation because we say that vary, uh, samples do vary and so how much, by how much is each value different from the mean? That will be the standard deviation. And then of course the sample size is what you said. The smaller the sample, the larger, the wider uh, the, the interval. So all these things will affect the, the errors that you will include. So allow me to ask you to pick up that formula for the margin of errors because we will use that a lot in the computations. And so if you ask me, um, what is the formula for the confidence interval? It is what you see on the title of this slide. It is the mean plus or minus the margin of error. So in a nutshell, I will now say that the true population value for the mean, mu, is equals to what I get from the sample, x bar, plus or minus the margin of error. And that is what we have done here. And the margin of error is what we've given as determined by these three parameters. I think that is clear now. Um, I think I've jumped the guards. This is the formula I've just talked about. And I would like you to look at the uh, the representation here <clears throat> for a 95% confidence level. So the green area represents your 95% level of confidence, meaning that on both tails, you have 2.5%, 2.5%. This is a normal distribution. That's why you have both on the left and the right, and this is symmetrical. So in a nutshell, this is what we will use. The mean plus or minus a few numbers there. <clears throat> uh, so there's a slight deviation then. There's a, there's a catch that we, or a, a, smi, a slight, slightly important concept here that we need to take note of. Previously, <clears throat> I have said that we are assuming normal distribution. But many a times, um, the sample size we collect may not reflect normality, or it may not reach the threshold of 30. Remember, we said that for in statistics, in statistics, especially quantitative, n should be at least 30. So if I'm to construct confidence intervals from a small sample, less than 30, then uh, we will not really have our source. So there will be a different technique to use. But in our case, if the sample size is large and we know what our standard deviation is, then it is easy to just use our Z scores that we used before. Remember the Z distribution has a special property that it has a mean of zero and standard deviation of one. This is a normal distribution, the Z distribution, when you normalize, and that's what you have here. However, when there is a, a, a slight a modification, when there is a change, especially on the sample size, then the distribution will no longer fit the Z, uh, normally, no, the Z, the st standard normal distribution. So you need another distribution to apply the same uh, kind of logic. And so that's, that particular distribution is known as a student T distribution. So when they say the t-test, it comes from that. So we shall be talking about the t-test in a moment. So the question is, do you have a large sample? N greater than 30 is your standard deviation known, then you use the z-test, just like we've done here. Otherwise, if this is not the case, if you don't know the, the standard deviation and you have a small sample, then you can just compute. You can compute the standard deviation from the sample. And then you use what is called a T statistic, T distribution, which is right in here. So we shall just modify the Z and call it T. Please note that I have said, this is, for example, here Z alpha over two. This alpha over two means I'm splitting this into two. The 5% is split into half on both ends. That's why we look at that. 
Good. Now, so case number two is when you use the t-test. That means you have a small sample. Sometimes the population is not known, or rather the standard, the standard deviation is not known. So you just have apply the same concept. Instead of the z-score, we now use a t-score. And then instead of the population variance, the standard deviation use a sample standard deviation. So this will be coming out from the sample. However, because of the issue of samples, in under T statistic, we have something referred to as the degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom represents the value, the number of observation that is free for further analysis. That is a standard definition of what is called degrees of freedom. I just want to give an example for you to have an idea of what degrees of freedom is. Dr. Yes, please. Could you please go back for just a second? No problem there. Pardon? Is there a slide? Yeah, I've gone one. Yes. Yes, yes, second. Uh -huh. Just a second. No problem. So what I'm as you as I wait for you, the point here is that as you construct confidence intervals, be aware of uh, the size of your sample you're working with. Be aware of the level of confidence you choose. Also, be informed that the standard deviation can either be known or unknown in this case. Thank you. Mm. So if it is unknown and you have a small sample, then you do not use the Z scores or the Z state distribution. What you now use is a T statistic. In um in uh, when you come to hypothesis testing, regression models, we shall be using a lot of the t-test. It's going to be something we shall be referring to quite a lot of time. So I wanted to explain this concept called degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom is basically the number of observations. But it is the number of observations that is left after performing a certain operation after working with the data maybe for the first time for example generating the first moment which is the mean for instance if i have a sample of uh, if i collect 30 uh, data points if my first observation is to compute the average number if it is the average wage earnings if i look at the sample of 30 employees compute the average wage so this step alone of computing the average consumes one observation. And that is why we're saying that should you want to proceed thereafter, and perhaps I want to generate maybe the variance, the variance of these wages, already you will be left with 29 observation because the first step has consumed one observation. So this is a statistical principle in, uh, it is a principle in, in statistic to guard this sample size so that it doesn't drop as much as it, uh, as much to the extent that it affects the reliability of your estimates. And so whenever you see the degrees of freedom, they are basically referring to the observations, only that a few of them will have been used. In our case, the one I've given you for the t-test, we say, it's, the degrees of freedom is n minus one. This one is because already you will compute the average from the sample. So already one observation is gone. So as you look out in your T scores or the T tests or T tables, ensure that you take into account the fact that because you're dealing with small samples, you must guard the number of observations that are left and you adjust accordingly by taking out one observation. I think that is an important statistical concept that you need to pick up along the way. I added a few points for us to talk about the T versus the Z, noting that the Z distribution we talked about last week is normally distributed with a mean of zero and variance of one. There's a slight difference between the Z and the T. The T on the other side is the same, it has the same shape, bell-shaped. It is still symmetrical. The only problem is that the only difference is that it has an avia tail. 
meaning that it's a little bit flatter compared to the Z score. So whereas, for instance, the Z score will have a normal distribution like that, I assume that is a normal one, the Z, the T will be a little bit flatter because of the fact that uh, the, the, because of the adjustment to the degrees of freedom and also the fact that the T, the T distribution involves perhaps um, a smaller samples for that matter. So which means that it has more variation. So it has more variance compared to this one. So it still has a mean of, uh, so T is still normally distributed with a mean of zero, but the variance is greater than one, which means that it's a bit flat. Because of the fact that it's a bit flatter, then uh, it will have that kind of a, a shape, which also means that there will be many T distributions, but there's only one Z distribution. That's the difference between the Z and the T. The Z is only Z because it's a standard normal. Standard means it is zero, one. But the T, because it has a variance greater than one, it means that it can take 1.5, 1 1.8, 2, and the rest. So there will be as many T distributions as there could be but it will depend on many things like the number of observations for, for that matter. But take note of the fact that as you increase the sample size, as you increase the decrease of freedom, then the distribution will almost match the normal distribution. So which tells you that for T statistic, that for the T distribution, um, you could possibly be working with smaller samples compared to the Z. So this is good uh, theory for you to reflect uh, at some point, I have shared this with you. It's I put it on the slides, but the T distribution table is found in many statistical books. Uh, I've just taken a screenshot of this one, but this is a complete T table. It has it has different things in here. At the first, the, on the column running from one all the way down there is the degrees of freedom which is basically the number of observations. In our case, it's n minus one, if you if you can recall. So we will do n minus one for this side. And then up, up here, we'll have two things. The level of confidence. Is it 95% or 90% or, uh, or what or 90% or 99%? What, or, uh, or so you will now choose what is the level of confidence you are attaching to it? There are two of them. There's the first row for one tail test. So the first category there, you can see up there, you have that one for, if you're choosing a one tail test, which means that um, for one tail, it means that you the test is conducted on one end, but you should always know that uh, they mean the same. When I say one tail test, for example, where, where am I lighting? It means that on one, on one, one of the tails, it is 0 0.025. But if it's a two tail, when I combine the two, I'll get 0 0.05. So that is one way. Or you can consider now the second one, which is now the two tail, which is the second. So it doesn't matter which one you read. You will read the same. Um, it will just be the same thing. So when I say, uh, let's look at the T values at certain critical values, at T, you can as well refer to the table. So what you'll be looking for is basically the values inside the graph. These are the critical values. And don't worry because uh, already I've, I've, um, I've given you the, the, the main, the commonly used ones. Just want to give you, just go back a few slides to just show you what we have done here. Yeah, this one's, I think, uh, just a moment, it's a place, good, here. Yeah. Say, for example, at 95% level of confidence, that is like, this is the 5% level of significance, is 1.96. This is for, sorry, I'm referring to the Z-scores, but I should, but it's the same thing for T in any way. Uh, for 99% for is 2.58. So, but for T statistics, the only difference is that you must refer to the, uh, you must refer to the degrees of freedom. So it will just be dependent on the degrees of freedom. But otherwise, it's the same thing for Z scores. 
So I've shared with you the T table, which is this one. I've also shared with you the standard to normal, the Z test, Z score table, which is also this one. Um, but beauty with it is you nowadays we have uh, some of these functionalities or functions in Excel. So you don't have to really go back and forth to these tables. So what I would like to expect you, for example, is to just go to this, uh, the Excel functions for each of them. And we shall use that one as, as part of the example. So these are the functions if you want. For example, if you want to uh, determine the critical value for from the T distribution table, rather than just going through this table, just go to Excel and then uh, go to this uh, function, that is Excel function, which is equals to T dot inverse. That will give you the T values that you are seeing in this table. And for this one, for Excel, you can do for any sample size. That's the thing. So uh, I will expect you perhaps to try out that one. Let me just give you just, just a moment as I, I open my Excel. So hopefully you can see my screen. I'm trying to enlarge. So if you don't want to work with those numbers in Excel or in the in, in the statistical tables, just go to any Excel, just execute the Excel function is equals to uh, t dot inverse. Uh, then you can pick whichever, either the T inverse or the two tail, doesn't matter. So if I pick on this one, the two tail, all you will now need is to pick the probability and the degrees of freedom. So for, for Excel, instead of just you going to this table that I've given you manually, just go to Excel, um, execute the command, or rather the function for equal to, actually always equal to is a, default for Excel functions. So when I say equals to, you know that it's about T distribution. So T dot distribution, you know, then you can, uh, sorry, T inverse. Then pick on any, even if it's this other one, you double click. When you double click, you can put your p-value 0 0.05, for example. And then you put a comma, decrease of freedom is 14, and then put a comma there. So there you'll have known the 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 the, P, the the critical values. So Excel gives you these tables for the, for the critical values and also for yeah actually for critical values. So for those of us who who, are, who don't like referring to tables, already you have your tables in Excel. All you just need to do is to execute the right function for the same. So what I mean by here is that T inverse. And then the probability is your values up here. Is it 0 0.05 for one tail or two tail? 0 0.10. And then you put your degrees of freedom. Then you have your function. For the one for the standard normal table, it's the same idea. The same idea. Only that this is a little confusing because the one I've given you gives you the the tables, but from the negative side, you no know, left side, left sided test alone. So it means that the values there are the ones on the left. So that's why they are all in negatives. They are all in the negative category. So I will show you how this is going to be right in a moment. But if you don't want to go the manual process, we have the Excel function for the standard normal table which is what you can also, also see here. So this is equals to your Excel function equals to normal normally distributed uh, for a sample with inverse distribution given by that. one. So this is one minus. You can do one minus the, the alpha, which is 5%, 0 0.05 divided by two. If it's, if it's a two tail test. Yeah, so that you can now get your 95% confidence level. If it's 
you just need to put here 0 0.01 divided by 2 because 99% is this the alpha there is 1% which is 0 0.01 but then you divide by 2 so i've given you all the formula you will need so that you don't struggle going back to the table yeah as long as you have excel you can comfortably work with it so that is just uh, good information for everyone to just uh, try out things in here. Otherwise, there are questions I've asked, I've, I've uploaded on the e-learning for your own uh, practice and exercises. Any questions though? Any questions on the theory? That is part one of the meeting today. You look at the theory and then part two, we do a few questions. And then lastly, we will introduce you to what I shared, the, the document I shared with you, the file, the zipped file. Uh, Kuraswali, let me see if there's any question, any contribution. You don't have necessarily to answer a question, ask a question. Okay, good. Looks like we are good. Hello, sir. Oh, oh sorry, yes. Please proceed. Good evening, Dr. Ari. Good evening to you. I, I don't really have a question on what we're covering. I'm just wondering what uh, what software are you using to open your PDFs and PowerPoints on the same page so that I can download the same? Um, for my PowerPoints and okay, the oh, whatever I right have. Now. Oh, uh, uh, this is um, yeah. Is it Foxit or something? Yeah, this is the one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. If I find it useful because it has more functions compared to the normal the, the, the normal one. I can see there's more features there. So it's useful for yeah, good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now let's <clears throat> let me see what I have. The questions ready. Mm, oh, someone's oh, Otello, you are here. Yes. How are you, Dr. Uh, welcome, sir. I'm fine, thank you. Okay, now I wanted to find out where do you get that, that uh, other PDA with that, so many quotes <laughs> of That's many things. <laughs> uh, Good question. The same question someone asked. Eh? Um, okay. Look for this one. Mm. Yeah, that's the name. I hope you can see. Mm. Foxit Phantom PDF. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I I find it uh for me I find it works best for me. Uh, but you're always free to use the other one as well, the normal. It. Okay, that was a good one. You can get it online. Sure, it works for you. Oh, good. Um, let's let me pull out my questions. We'll, we'll try it out. Of, we'll try a few of these questions manually. Then uh, I will have understood the level, these confidence interval things. Then from there, we can now engage with the other software which I shared. Now, let, let me pick the name appearing last in my list here to read the question. Uh, this is uh, Zipora, yes. Zipor, are you there? Yes. yes. Zipor, read for other square. Read for other questions. Yes. To estimate. Oh. Are you there? Yeah. Question one. Yes. Good. A bank branch manager wishes to estimate the average amount. A bank branch manager wishes to estimate the average amount of money held by its delinquent debtors. The bank's data analyst runs of their delinquent account and determines that oh. the odd is 
Okay, looks like you're not audible enough. Zipporah, we can't follow it up. Okay, maybe we'll, we'll give you the next round. Eh? You're breaking quite a lot. Unless, it, is it like, is that the case with everybody else? We are not, no. we aren't. Uh, yeah, okay. Let's have Gaki. Why Gaki? Zipporah will give you another opportunity. Pick it up, Gaki. Over to Yvonne. Yvonne. Ah, Yvonne. Proceed. Okay. Othello, it looks like you are the savior. Okay, let me try. All right. Question number one. A bank branch manager wishes to estimate average amount of money owed by its delinquency debtors. The bank's data analysts randomly select 100 of their delinquent accounts and determines that the average amount owed is $230. Past records revealed that the standard deviation of the amount owed for all delinquent accounts is $90. Construct a 99% confidence interval for the mean amount of money owed. Good, nice. That is the Thank task. you. That's so the task at hand. Question one is <laughs> you. Yes, that's the one we want to look at right now. All right. Okay, then let's then let's attack it then. So we've looked at it, so we can address it as follows. Um just want you to pick out the key issues there, the key variables of interest to us. We have um we have the average. Um, amount owed is $230. We have a sample size of 100. We want, and then we have a standard deviation, which is also known at 90. So we need to look at the interval because you want to know from the bank, from all the delinquency accounts or the liquidity debt accounts, for that matter, well, what is the average? What is the average amount owed for all the accounts they do have? They could be running in so many um, accounts or many other branches all over, but if just sample a hundred of them, and that is what we get. So for sure, we will need to pick out one of the things that is one, you have a sample size of a hundred, suggesting to me that you might not use the T statistic, we will be safer using the Z scores or Z statistics for the Z distribution for that matter. Good, so let's now look at it as follows. So we're dealing with question one. So from the question one, we have established a few things. First things first is the fact that we have an average. Oh, of course, we have a sample size of 100. That's the first characteristic. The second thing we are told is that we have an average uh, uh, amount owed. Let's call it the X bar for mean from the sample, which is $230. We also have a thing that is key. We have some information about the standard deviation. Was it 90? I think so. $90 as well. So that's my sigma. And then I'm also having the 95, the question is about 95% confidence interval estimation, which is also uh, similar to the 5% level of significance. Is not 99%? Oh, sorry. Good, good. Thank you. Thank you for that one. So, it Where is that coming from? Come again. Where is the 100 coming from? I've not uh, seen the sample size. The samples, the sample the of, yeah, I thought it was there. Then the question. Yeah, sample yeah. Sample right here. 100. Nine, yes. nine, 100 delinquency accounts are there. Mm, yeah, it's 100 is there. Mm, and it's 100, thank you. Proceed, so this is 99%. Allow me to just correct this. We have 99 over there, which corresponds to 1% level of significance. Then so that is one thing. The, second, the third thing is that we'll use a set 
distribution. Based on the sample size greater than 30. So having said that, then you would want to now imagine that your, from what we've been talking about from the beginning, our confidence level will lie between a smaller and a upper limit or a lower and upper limit. So which means that this mean uh, the true the true population mean, which is my mu, will be in such a manner that I will get the information from the sample mean plus or minus the margin of error. Good. So which means that then I'll definitely have my X bar, which is my mean, plus or minus my margin of error. If you can recall from the theory the class we just had, we need a Z score value. And this Z score value will, we have the, the value split into two sections because we have the low, the left, or rather the left and the right sided test or Z value. You multiply by the stigma, which is my standard deviation divided by the square root of n. And I think with that, we are good. We are good to go. We just need now to fill in the information as, as such. So having said that, having said that, let's now get our break. Let's get our values. X bar, we already know. We need now to get your Z value. Z alpha over two. What is it equal to? Because so really we now we have the X bar, we have these other. What is this uh, critical value for the Z score? And uh, for sure, you have noticed that uh, I like us not to rely so much on this. Um, I know you don't want to be referring to this table every other time because this table I told you everything is in Excel as long as you just feed the right information. Let's, let's feed in this information for Excel, print in Excel. Just, I would like everyone to go to their computers, click on Excel. I'd like you to use the function that I've given you in the last slide to get me the Z score value consistent with 99% confidence interval. which is this one. This is a Z distribution table. Go to, go to your Excel, uh, execute or rather run the function equals normal S inverse. Then you have some numbers there. Tell me what you get. Noting that this is for 95%, I want you to do for 99%. Uh, if you've got any just post, let me get a few postings on the chat, then we'll pick it from there. If someone has gotten it already, I want I want to see what you post there on the chat. Yeah, so far, uh -huh. I've seen the first one. Let's move on. Uh, let me sample, I'm doing sampling. The second one has come, I'll count up to 10. I've seen 2.326, I've seen 2.5758. The third one. Oh, are we done? OK. 
Okay, I've seen 1.9, that's the third one. Seven more to go. Okay, we can see the fourth one has come, the fifth. Uh -huh. Five. Yes, yes, yes. Where is Tasleen? Where is Terry? Where is uh, Moline? Judy, Faith, let's see your postings there. Okay, I've seen another one. As Cindy, we've seen that response. Okay, good. Now, let's go with those seven. And uh, now we can make an assessment as to whether this is the case. So I'm expecting that uh, we execute the z-score command, or rather the z-score function in Excel for normal distribution. This is actually standard normal, sorry. See if it equals to the normal, which is standard normal, the inverse of one minus 0 0.01 divided by two. This is what you would want maybe to do. So let's have it as follows as I run it out. This is at 90. 9%. So let me put it right in here. So this equals to. So equals to. Norm. The standard norm. Please know that there are many normal distribution that you can see there. Please pick on the standard inverse one right here. Because it's a standard normal. Double click on that one. And you can see it only requires you to put the probability. It, in, it, it requires you to input the probability value. In our case, it is um, 0 0.01. But uh, of course, Excel would, would require perhaps that you do the difference from 100 because of the fact that you're looking at the confidence level. So one minus that amount. So let's let, I'll show you the other technique, the other way of doing it. One minus zero point zero one divided by two because it's two sided. So that I have on both ends zero point zero zero five zero point zero zero five because there are two ends. Then from there you hit enter, you get that one. So that is the value you're looking at here. Two point five eight. Another way of looking at it is. Let's, let me show you a different way, but this one you must know how to read it. So you let's go back to the same thing, equal to normal distribution, the standard one, which is this one, double click on it, where we just were. Let's put the value the way it is without doing one minus. I want you to put a zero point uh, let's have it as 0 0.005. Let me check. Is that 5? Mm, okay. Yeah. Mm. 0 0.005. Then see what we get. But hopefully, you see that it's the same thing except that it's a negative. So if you are, I've put here 0 0.005, someone is wondering why am I putting 0 0.005? Because we are doing 99%, 99% is a confidence interval, meaning that the level of significance is 1%. 1% 1 is 0 0.001. Sorry, 0 0.01. That is 1%. And because it's two-sided, 
it should now be 0 0.005. So that's why I've said you, we have input this value here of 0 0.05 because on both ends, we have, a neg we have 0 0.005 on the negative side and on the positive, totaling 0 0.01. That's why you've input in here. So this is one way of doing it. You, instead of doing one minus, you can do straight the p-value the, the level of significance, sorry, but you just ignore the negative. You just take the critical value as 2.58. So whether it you, you, you go this way or this way, the critical value will be 2.58. The only difference is that on this other side, it will be on the negative side. This other one will be on the positive side. So it doesn't really matter. So for graphic, graphically speaking, that is the graph, the graphical representation of that is what you can see perhaps right in here. That I have 2.58 on the positive side. I also have negative 2.58 on the other side. And there's really no difference between which is which. So the fact remains is that you need to pick 2.58. So I just want you to know how to utilize the Excel functions as opposed to just going to the tables or over and over again. So let's pick the value 2.58 for the question. So this is equals to, we have uh, inputted a, in Excel equals to the norm S inverse of 0 0.005. And this gave us negative 2.58. This is on the negative side of the of the of the distribution or 2.58 also on the positive side so we go with the positive number we use that in the formula so let's now have the final solution so the interval now will be um, what was excuse the mean me. yes so, please Dr. so now the, the both of them cancelled each other so where do we place the mean the mean must be no, no. Isn't it? Which one now? Uh, we, we have a negative 2.15, uh, oh, 2.58, okay. then positive 2. No, 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 no. Yeah. Uh, that is not the point. Okay. The point was to identify the yeah. critical value for Z. Okay. And we only pick the one value, the positive value. Because the critical value is the boundary. If you see the graph I just drew here, Whichever way you look at it, you will you will you still get two point five eight. You so on the negative side or on the positive side. All we are interested in is what is the z value. In absolute terms, it is two point five eight, and this is the one we are going to go with. So this one goes into the formula straight away. I was just demonstrating two ways of of achieving the same thing in Excel, but at the end of it all, you go with the positive number. So let's put our values in the formula. Well, what was our mean? Our mean was 230. 30. Plus or minus 2.58. Times. Multiply by, um, what is the standard deviation? 90. 90 mm -hmm. divided by the square root of 100. So I'm replacing the formula right here with these numbers. Please compute for me this. 230, not 2.3, 2.230. Plus or minus, please get this number for me, the error, the margin of error. Twenty. Twenty what? Twenty. Twenty three point two two. Twenty two. I've had twenty two. No, twenty three. Um, am I hearing twenty three? Twenty three. Twenty three point two two. Okay. So twenty three point two because these are accounts. We we will go with the we round it off to our whole number, right? Yeah, because this yeah okay. we can never yeah we don't have we don't have points of accounts. Eh? 
So we go with 23. So this means you can now create the interval as follows, that it is plus or minus 23. Can you now write the final answer as the as follows? Confidence interval, which will be now, this means the population will lie between two values. Yes, let's add and subtract 23. What is the lower limit? To a 6.78. Um, six. Round it off to a seven to two hundred and what fifty three. Hello, Doctor. Ratings, yes. You've said that uh, the mean is for accounts, and so it cannot have decimal places. All right. However, yes. however, in the question, the mean was actually in in dollars, which means it is an oh. amount. So okay. unless it is, it is, it is, right. it's fine. Okay. It is fine. It's fine. It's okay. I get you. I get you. Yeah, because the amount, the, the mean was actually in dollars, right? Yeah, it's yeah, it's possible that we we can have those decimals. I agree with you. Thank you. Another one is up, or it was the same one. Looks like it was the same one. Let's how let's let let me do second question. And I'll give you some minutes to do another one. Let me do question two because it's related to the same question. Now, the same scenario, you're told that suppose the manager in the first question that you've seen above there wants to estimate a 95% confidence level. And the confidence level is such that the mean amount owed will lie between 220 and 240 with the same standard deviation. So how many accounts must this person sample? If he wants to come to a conclusion that the, the interval is between 220 and 240, what will be the desired sample size to collect for such a conclusion to be made? So this is now an indirect question unlike the one that we had done earlier. In the first case, it was 100, some, 100 accounts. So what number of accounts will be consistent with what we want to conclude? So as usual, as you do math, you break down the problem further, and then we see how we'll come up with a solution. Let's now, let, let's go to question two. Can you estimate 300? <laughs> Or you just you have to get that number from somewhere. <laughs> I okay. Uh, do you think <laughs> that's a good question? Paul Amata will tell you the answer. That reverse question yes. is now disturbing me. <laughs> the first question. The reverse one. The reverse, eh? Oh. Yeah. But I the, I hope it makes sense. That's what in probability. <laughs> Yeah, it's making sense. Yeah, the question makes sense. Allow me to just charge my a little bit. Got my charger as you reflect on that question. Good. There we go. Now let's now do the question two. The question is asking us to, we're looking for the sample size. For question two, we've already been told that the mean lies between two values, 220 and 240 with 95% level of confidence that is the first piece of information we have we still need to know that we have the same standard deviation as 90 dollars um i think that is the only information we do have so what is n that is a key question. So we want to work back, backward. 
first of first of all, we must. The first point is that we need to understand the formulation of this interval given in here. It came because we know that this mean from the population will is given by the mean from the sample of whatever we want to know, we want to sample, plus or minus the margin of error, which in our case, Z over two multiplied by the sigma over N. So already we have the interval right there. We have, we can work with a mean and then we can get now this animal. You notice that it's a very simple question, much as in the first case, it might be confusing, but it's very simple. So notice one thing, the interval always lies between a lower and a upper value. And they are of equal measure. That's why you say plus or minus a number. So you need to get an average for these two first of, first of all, because it must be a upper value and a lower value. And then that gives you the margin of error. So the question that we now ask is, what is the margin of error? So it means I need to get it right here. So I can simply do the 220 plus the 240 divided by two so that I can get this average. And for sure, you still get the same number of 230. So this is 230 because this is an average position, which means therefore that the this population mean will be 230 plus or minus the margin of error. And in our case, this average is 230 plus or minus 10, if you can check from here. So $10, $10 be, uh, be, uh, below, $10 above. So therefore, the margin of error is equals to 10. So you can now make inference. I'd like now you to compute the rest. There, thus, the margin of error, which is uh, what we gave as z score alpha over two, multiplied by sigma over square root of n, this should give you 10. The value that you get from here should give you 10. And so um, we can get, so how did we get 10? I want someone to ask, answer me. How did we get 10? Yes, Maureen. Minus or minus ah, okay. Sure. From the question, uh, from the question given, remember this is what we have. You are told that the range is between twenty to forty. You can see that is a gap of twenty already, but you see we are interested in the midpoint. The midpoint is two thirty, so it's two thirty, ten steps above and ten steps before, and that's why we have the 10 coming in. I hope that is clear. I think you have, you have noted that. Now, I'll ask you now to input those values there. Let's input what is required. Get for me the Z score consistent with 5%. Okay. Yes, yeah, everyone now go to the Excel function. No more, the standard normal distribution. Uh, at five percent. Mm, One point nine six. Correct. Yeah. So please know that the the Z alpha over two will be one point nine six. Correct. I agree with you. Um, equals to norm. The Z score here. Let's let's input the 0 0.025. Well, that is a consistent with the 5%, 2.5% on each. And then you get 1.96. This is a negative value, but I told you pick the, the absolute value positive and you get it 1.96. So having said that, I want you now to compute the end. So 1.96 by by uh, sigma was 90 divide by square root of n, and that should give you 10. 
So 1.96 multiplied by 90 divided by 10 is equal to square root of n. Cross multiplication. So I brought the 10 down here, took the square root of n to the right. Uh, okay, I hope some people have gotten me the answer at some point as we get there. Yes, 4.24. 4.24. I don't know if my calculations are right. It's just so small. That's so small. Let's 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 uh, let's get it together. Um, one point nine six times nine. Nineteen point six four. Is this nineteen point six four? Seventeen. Seventeen. Seventeen point six four. Good. A square root of n. From there, you square both sides. Oh, yeah, if you square both sides, you get something. So 17.64 squared is equals to n. Which is 311.169. 311.169. Yeah. Alternatively, you can now say this is n should be 311. Because these are now number of accounts. 311. Done. Good. Good, you have come to my number. <laughs> <laughs> now we need to ask, how did you get to 300? <laughs> okay. Now, um, yes, Osanya. I'm thinking N should be 312. N 312. Huh? Not 311, because it will be mm. below than the accounts. Accounts, eh? Mm, oh. um, well, it I may not say yes or no. I'll, I'm not going to disagree with you entirely. I will also not disagree with the 311. Uh, of course, uh, you have uh, someone may argue, I rounded off to a whole number, it became 311. And then Osanya will also say, because I've already hit 311, at other point one, I can make it 312. So, I am okay with either. Mathematically, you can't push 311.17 to 312. Yes, mathematically, you can't. Uh, no, on really the basis of, that's why I'm saying, <laughs> let that one be an, another another discussion on another day. In fact, <laughs> correct mathematically is 312 because we are sampling. If you sample 311 accounts, it may not hit uh, what we are looking for. It will yeah, so, because considering something else you did in the previous calculations, uh, like let's go. Well, there's no uh, what I'm what I'm saying is, uh, if you are strict mathematician, three eleven is the answer. If you are now lay, saying because I'm doing research, uh, um, I mean there's no harm having one more, so there's no problem with it as well from a research point of view. Because that, that number is very uh, a little bit insignificant, but you could as well go with 311. I don't have a problem with it. You know, as long as you are just within the neighborhood, it's no problem. But if this was a, a, an, an exact thing we're looking for, a p-value or a, a something that is a bit precise like that, then, then either way it's fine. Okay. Uh, Kedogo, you are here. We can see your hand. Hello. Um, yes. Sorry, I, I I was out for a while. I've just logged in after a blackout, and uh, sorry. I'm sorry floating. I don't know what mm -hmm. what topic are we discussing, because I'm eager to follow along. Um, uh, from the lecture notes. Uh, thank you for the question. From the lecture material, this is the topic we are dealing with. Eh? It's on the it's the notes are in the e-learning. So we have covered the material on confidence interval estimation. So you can just get along. We have done the uh, the, the theory. We are now looking at questions which are also on the e-learning. I don't know okay. the advanced you. Yeah, so we yes, are in this question. Thank you. 
yeah so that you can flow in okay before i can give you one question um like us to look at a different question altogether maybe the last one this one let's look at question six let me have a volunteer to read yeah, i'm just following because my phone is dead <laughs> i can't ah. <laughs> I can question five or six. Question six. Question five. Sorry, five. Five. Oh, sorry, five. five. Mm -hmm. Regina, are you on? You can read. Yes, I can. Okay, you are required to construct and then interpret. Up, and then up, up, let's let's start with the question. Context. Oh, Context. Question, question five. Five. Oh, five. Five. Okay. Nutritionists are investigating the efficacy of a diet plan designed to increase caloric intake among elderly people. The increase is daily caloric intake in 14 elderly people who are put on the plan. It's shown below. Okay. You, you can see now it goes to the question. So you are required to construct and interpret a 95% confidence interval for the mean increase in caloric intake for all people who are put on this diet. Assume that population of differences is in intake is normally distributed. All right, good, there we go. So we have a question like that. So they've just sampled 14 individuals but they have many people have put in this plan, but they would like us to, to understand the average caloric intake for the entire group of so many people, but they've just sampled out 14. I'd like you to understand the context of just picking small samples in certain contexts. At times you may not necessarily want to go up to 30 or 40, depending on the context in, of the question. For example, we have what is called destructive samples. I think destructive samples, if you look at a, a question, I think this question five or question six. Yeah, uh, if you look at this question, for example, as I read so that I come back to the other one, some quality control experiments require destructive sampling to measure some characteristics of a product. A company uh, which leads in manufacturers of printers wants to determine the number of character characters printed before the, the printer just collapses or print ad for the print ad falls, fades. The company tests 15 randomly selected print ads and records the number of characters in millions print, printed until the fail the failure of each sample. So sometimes it is it is loss making. It is not prudent to collect so many samples exceeding 30 when you want to look at situations like this. So you just want to maybe pick a few cases for, for good reasons. So I'm just uh, justifying well, the question as to someone say, why can they just increase the sample to that? Maybe this will be safer for the organization to just uh, do what is called the, the destructive sampling. Now, this Excuse is the question me, that Anna. Yes, please. I thought uh, the bigger the sample uh, population, mm -hmm. the accurate uh, the results will be. But uh, what you are saying that in some cases, you know, the way you want to maybe test the whether, and uh, you know, the for, for certain expensive, maybe uh, equipment that you've maybe uh, manufactured in your, in your company, the cost of production can be so high to the extent that if you want to increase the sample of those ones you want to test, if the probability of the lo if the losses are so high, sometimes some of, some of these limits can be reached that you would want to maybe take just a few cases. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not disputing your claim. Statistically speaking, you can do more samples. But in some other contexts, increasing the sample can be costly to the, to the organization. And so it might, uh, you have to balance between the accuracy there and maybe the loss and the rest. So, so at times it gets along like that. 
So when I say, when you see samples which are small and you want to question, ah, why don't they just do more so that they can get accuracy? Organizations have different ways of looking at things. But anyway, that's, that's not the point. The point is you have a question here to address uh, where you have a smaller sample. Now, what we do is uh, you will need to construct the confidence interval, 95% confidence and confidence interval. But I hope someone is noticing that in this context, we will not now use the set scores. So question five. So please know that this is a T distribution question, distribution table question. The reason we are using the T is because we have N equal to 14, which is basically less than 30. How do you distinguish between T and Z? Okay, let me get an answer from somebody who was who got it from the discussion we had before. Okay, you've gotten so many answers at the same time. <laughs> so pick one which you you add. <laughs> it's less than 30, Othello. Okay, good. The sample size is small. All right, thank you. Mm. Right, good. Now let's proceed then. But remember, at the end of it all, the, 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 we follow the same principles. So in this case, let's uh, figure out what we need. Here, the average that we want will still fit the same formula we had, the plus or minus the margin of error. In our case, the margin of error will follow a T distribution with some degrees of freedom, alpha over two. Then the sigma is now becoming a sample, a sample uh, standard deviation divided by square root of n. Except everything except the alternation between the T distribution right in here and the sample standard deviation. So from um, what you need here is, can we quickly find X bar? Can you quickly find standard deviation? Can we quickly get the T alpha over two at 95%? So let's first of all fix what is fixable. How do you get the mean? Yeah, okay. So, uh, and we know how to get that very quickly. So the mean we can get from summing all these numbers given here, and then you get a quick standard deviation. Yeah, let's, let's, let's just, Let's use Excel to get this very quickly so that we can get the answers. Um, first of all, let's pick uh, let's pick the the sample, the data that we have. I'm copying this. So let me transfer them to Excel for very quick answers to what we're looking for. So I'm copying the data. I've copied this data set. I want to put them into Excel. Let me put them here. So that is the data set we have. Uh, how do I get the mean? I hope this, is it visible though? Yeah. Or I increase this? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's visible. I'm waiting for a submission. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, let's, 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 uh, let, let's put this in a complete lower or a column. Let me copy the other ones. I cut them, I put them here so that I have the data arranged in whichever order. I've just put them together. It's easier to just compute it from there. So we can do an average here. What is the Excel function for the average? Is it equals average? Okay, equals to average. So I double click on the average, sorry. Then from there, I can just highlight the entire values and close the brackets. So I have a quick average of uh, 0.75. I can also get a standard deviation. Put it here. So equals to ST um, 
standard deviation for the entire group as well. 20. So for quick mathematics, you can just pick from here. So this is an example where you have a known variance. The variance is not known for the population, but you can estimate using the sample data and we've gotten 20. We've also gotten the average as 175. So let's pick these two values and take it a question. So this is 175, the other one is 20. Good. Uh, please try out for me as an exercise, get for me the critical value at 95%. Okay, get for me. I let me just help you with the Excel function very quickly. Go to that Excel function there. Can it be negative, Doctor? Because I'm getting a negative. You got a um, negative value? Yes. Yeah, okay. You got a negative oh, value. Absolute value. Always we say that you for this one, the idea is to get the cutoff point and you take the absolute positive value. Okay. Thank you. Okay, post your responses. Post your responses. Ninety five percent confidence level. Excuse me, Dr. Ari. Yes, please. You, you said that we're using, uh, if you use two tail and if we just use single tail, the answer should be the same. Yes, as long as you're inputting the right uh, value there. Okay. The right value for... Mm -hmm. okay, let me check. Yeah, the one that you use for one tail and there's another one for two tail. I'm waiting for responses on the chat. Nectar, I upload the formula. Can I get it, please? Uh, okay, okay. Let me let me share. Just a moment. There you go. DF is the degrees of freedom.
Hmm. What are we getting? Hello, Doctor. If I use uh two tails and one tail, I get two different vowels. Why you use so? <laughs> When you use two and you use one. Mm -hmm. Okay, let, let I wanted to sample that was, that is actually the test I wanted to hear from the members so that I can see the variation in the responses. I am seeing 1.69. Someone has posted 1.69. I wanted to, to see more. Use the one for T inverse. Good. Let me sample the ones that are there. Hmm. I am having many answers, different ones. Now this T one is interesting. Then one point six nine, one point three five, one point two point one six, one point six four, one point seven seven, one point seven seven again. Ah. Which is which? Someone said they have used a table, they've gotten something else. Trying to open that table as well to just verify. Okay, let's let, let's have one common solution for this case so uh um i want you to see the formula right there so this is t inverse the p value there and the degrees of freedom first of all the degrees of freedom is 13 right now this is where the catch is because the t inverse in Please input the one for the two-sided thing, the two-sided test, which is a 0 0.025 on one tail. Remember, this is like on one end of the tail. This is the first, the one say one tail. On one end of the tail, I have 0 0.025. So pick this one, 0 0.025. It is because that is the value on one of the tails. One tail has that one. The other tail has the same value. And there we get. So I want now to get one uniform answer. So T inverse, 0 0.025, and then 13. Excuse me, Dr. Ari. Yes. What was the confidence level? It was, was it 95, 95 or 97.5? It is 95. And then how comes you're choosing for T.975? No, uh, it, it, you see this one? Yes. This is a different thing. It is cumulative. Okay. Ignore the cumulative angle. It, it's going to mm -hmm. confuse you a little bit. Okay. But work with the either the one or two. So okay. uh, just interpret this thing, this line oh. here, as okay. saying, on one of the tails, okay. I have two point five percent. Thank you.
Good. So equals to t dot inverse. Pick the first one there. Zero point zero two five with thirteen. There you go. Okay, my own. Please tell me. Please ex explain to me why you, before you continue. Explain mm. to me for that till getting us where how we got to that till would be zero point uh, zero two five, and uh, then we go. Yeah. Which there? How did we reach to that place? And we jump over all these ones. <laughs> so thirteen. Doctor, you are also the thirteen. The thirteen. Okay. Mm. Let me start with Othello's question. Remember, in uh, in uh, what we've been doing is we are dealing with t tests, the t distribution. The t distribution. Oh, sorry. Let me just put it here. Uh, the t distribution is still normally distributed. That you should know. Just like the z distribution, and we are doing ninety five percent confidence interval. Meaning, you want to give ninety five percent probability that your interval will contain the true value of the population. Meaning. The acceptance level, that range should be 95%. Remember, this is a starting point. So on both sides, you have, or rather the cumulative, assuming this, this it has a mean of zero. The other ones are positive values, the negative values. So 95% is what we're looking for. So this other side here is 2.5%. And the other one is also 2.5%. So that it, com it completes 100. And this, this one is 0 0.025. And this is also 0 0.025. This is why we've chosen this, because that area is 0 0.025 and okay. also there. Negative and positive. Right. It doesn't, yeah, it says, uh, the way you look at this table, it yeah. says on one side of the tail, on one of the tails, yeah. It is 25%. Right. You are at 2.5%, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so that one we have uh, we have sorted you out. The second question was asked about the 13. And I think yeah. for 13, we had we had we had mentioned here that for T distribution, because the sample size is small, we must adjust the degrees of freedom is n minus one. And so my n is 14. Oh, four. Question. Yes. Yeah, Good. it was 14. Okay. So 14 subtract one. Good. Now, now we let's now complete the question. Complete the rest of the question by now uh yeah. substituting the rest. Yeah, I think it's simpler than mine. Doctor. Great, yes. Uh, question here. Yes. Why is it that when you use a two tail, or okay, a single tail, one tail on Excel, you get that, but when you use it on, uh, when you use two tail, you get a different value? Is it? You must. Uh, That's interesting because. Yes. I hope it is going. It should not be the, it should not, let's try it, eh? You must yes. get the same answer. It's the same. I've yeah. used 0 0.05 and it gives me the same answer. Uh, T inverse. If I take the second option, is that what you're saying? Then you double this one to 0 0.05 and the other one 13. Is that okay? It gives you the same thing. Sorry, is it 13 or 14? Yeah, it is 13. What it says here is the critical value on, on the two tails. Because one tail is 0 0.025, the other one is 0 0.025. Combined, it becomes 0 0.05. And then the decrease of freedom are for 13. So it should be the same thing. So whether you use the second or the first option, uh, they should give you the same answer. The only thing is that this one gives you a positive number, and which is also good. Oh, but it doesn't absolutely. matter. Yeah, good. Thank you. Uh, thank you. All right. And I think from the table, you can also confirm that this is the case. 0 0.025 is right in here. 
and this is the value at sample size 13 degrees of freedom, and you get 2.16. Should be the same thing. So this table is in Excel. The beauty with it is that with the Excel, you can even do with more, with, with, with a number like 43, or even with 33. If You see this one starts from one to 30, and then from there it jumps to 30 to 40, to 60 to 80, like that. So there's no, they will not get the values for, for the in-betweens. Okay. Because of the fact that uh, it uses small samples, it wants to assume that maybe from 30 going up, you will use the Z-score. But there's no harm if you are to use a T-score, this scores for 32 or whatever. Still, it works the same. All right, good. Thank you. I think, Francis, you've gotten it 2.16. So please finish that question and get me the answer now that you have everything. I hope you've been working as we were discussing together. And I think you can do it quickly. X bar puts 175, plus or minus 2.16, and then S is 20, N is 14. Please don't put 13 here, put 14. The, the 13 was just for the critical value determination. So 175, plus or minus 2.16 times 20 over the square root of 14. And then you get the answer. 1.75 plus or minus some number. I think it's now complete. I want to get the final answer. 175 plus or minus some number there. Eleven point five four five. Let's go with that one. I've not done myself, but let's go with eleven point five. Or 11.54. So you can do your now the interval. You can do the lower limit and the upper limit. Add um, and, add and subtract 11.5. Oh, easy. Let's use 11.5 just for to make it simplify the, the analysis. So the 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 average will lie between an interval of um. 163.5 and 186.5. Come again, 150. And now 186.5. Okay. Same, same. Okay, those are very strict, strict instructions. Fine. So this is where we are. So that should be your confidence interval as such. Now you have something to work around and complete the tasks at your own time. Do the other three questions which were not done. Question number three, four. I thought I had another question though, but it's okay. Ah, it wasn't there. So for your own practice questions, complete the task. All right, now let's let me switch gears to talk about the conclude the concluding part of the lesson. Uh, I had shared a, a zip file for you to look at. Uh, in the next meeting, I believe it will be. I think the day is twenty eighth. We had, we had said next week we'll, we'll have some activity to be done in, 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 in the class. Um, so let's 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 say uh, for next week uh, we'll, 
be prepared, just prepare um, to do an activity. Uh, I'll give you some work to, to do in, in within the time that we have. Uh, but let's purpose yeah, that we that we meet. Um, I want to believe the normal time, uh, but I'd like you to do some bit of revision on what we've been doing, especially uh, from uh, measures of central tendency, measure of central tendency, uh, measures of dispersion, and then the distributions, the two that we did last week and this week. Just have an I just run through those so that I can give you, we'll, we'll meet briefly, and then I'll give you some work to do. If you notice that you already have, um, if you go to your e-learning, you already have, you are in groups already. I've put you in groups. So uh, I'll give you the, I'll, I'll assess you on the, I'll give you the nature of the work that you do next week. Of course, part of it will be, uh, what you do in groups, and the other one I'll maybe I throw in a question, yes, a question for you to just punch in the answers on the system. Yeah, so there will be a question there, you will work on something, it will be one question, and then you, you go to groups. I think that is what we intend to do. I hope it is clear. Josephine. Dr. E, kindly comment about this uh, uh, file that you sent. I'm trying to uh, open. Mm -hmm. That will be the last thing I'll do. Thank you. I'll do that. Yeah. Thank I'll come to that, Josephine. But I have already communicated what we we'll do next week. We'll meet. I'll give you one or two. we we'll do one. I'll, I'll decide what we shall do first. And then I ask you to just go online, do questions here, here, and there. Now, let me comment now on the question for Josephine as the last thing. I'm also trying, let me open my file as well where I saved it. Um, hopefully, I don't know. let me share my screen again. This is the last thing I'm going to show with you. Um, sorry. Ah, can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, yeah. so. Everyone, I shared a file labeled S11, and you can see it is a zipped file. I zipped it because it was a bit bigger. Uh, I compressed a little bit more to become smaller and then zipped it. It's 72 MB. It's 72 MB. So my instruction is that this is uh, this this is stator. If you for for those who want to get it more. Uh, remember that in this course there was the option of SPSS. Um, I was not able to get a version that can be that you can all access at the same time. Yeah. So that one I could not get one, but this is a. Uh, it does. It still does the same things with actually an upgrade to SPSS. Uh, this is starter version eleven. Yeah, it's it's not the latest though. Remember that uh, we have latest versions to this. So I, I wanted us at least to have some bit of skill, not necessarily with uh, manual doing things manually and the rest, but of course also some have some skill that you can also input data and work around. I love. Uh, I know at some point you'll be collecting data for your research, but I ask you what? How will you analyze the data? You have your questionnaires, you've distributed, you you will input data in it. Then the question is, uh, of course, in statistics, you will not be able to compute things manually for your research because we are going to that extent, to the stage where we shall be doing hypothesis testing, you'll be doing correlations, you'll be doing uh, all those regression. And how do you how do you even conduct this and how which softwares will you use? Whether you use Stata or Excel or SPSS, the, the, the knowledge is the skill, and then number two, how you interpret those numbers. Yeah, I will also demonstrate the very basic descriptive statistics in it, which I think will be useful for a few of us. 
when you do hypothesis testing, I thought we shall not do it mechanically like we've done today, but I'll give you data. We will load into this one. We will we'll do those. Um, we, of course, we'll do the, the preliminary discussion on hypothesis, but then we'll just now do it practically. Um, I'll look for data set that might match what some of you would be intended to you intending to use, especially anything that has numbers. Um, some which have bio data for people, you know, classifications or categories, categorical data, for example, and how you can even use uh, some of the techniques for hypothesis testing to answer certain questions for research for for purposes of research. You know, comparing mean performance between two counties, uh, academic performance between groups and schools. Is, is there a significant difference between in the performances in different contexts? So you can compute that manually and compare means, variances, and the rest. But the hypothesis is what you're looking for. Is there a significant difference? We shall answer those ones in, this, in the next session. So I wanted you to pick this file. I'm sorry, it is only for Windows. I, didn't, I don't have another version which is compatible. So I don't know how I'm going to have those who have another other versions of their, uh, those who are not using Windows. So once you download this, please don't use this on the phone, uh, use on the computer or your laptop. Download it just as you download from the WhatsApp, save it somewhere, like mine I've saved in a folder. And I get a, just unzip this file. So by right clicking, I hope you have a, an, a zip extractor in your com in your computer so please extract extract files don't extract here if depending on with the one you use extract the files so that you now have a a folder for the same so if i click on extract files so it should extract and put them here and i click ok so what i'm looking for is um, a folder which has many, many files. Some of you are saying uh, it has many things, but that is exactly what we want because it has all the functions that you will need to do your analysis. So should you want to, if you don't have a software that you can use for your analysis of your data, you can learn this one as well. You can use this one and learn. And then from there, you can be able to. Yes, please. Can you, can you upload this a free version? Download a free version of this, and then, then you can um, able to extract the file. I don't. I've not tried that one. This is one I I we I was uh, I was donated to one time when I was a, a senior citizen somewhere. So the good thing is that it's 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 shareable. So I don't know that some of you could even having the latest, eh? and I'm encouraging you to use that one as well. So if you have the chance to get a new version, that's well and good. But the, the, the point is that this is now the file I was looking for, which is, I think, 196 MB. You can see 196 MB, but the zipped file is just 72 for ease of downloading. So what I wanted you to do is just open the all itself, and you can see it's written state 11. That's the software we'll use. When you open again, that's what you will need. We will just don't install anything. Don't install because it's just it is this is usable for any Windows computer. You don't have to download, you don't have to install it. So we will just be using this one. You will just open from here, you launch from this application here. Um you can decide to make it in you, you can save it in your test in your task bar here, right here, down here by right clicking. And then you send to, I mean, pin to task by if you want it to. If I pin to task by, it will come around here. It will come here. So that every time I just need to just click it once. So what we will do is just, you will be using this for analysis. So I'll just open it. You can double click from here or you open from there. It will open. This is what we want. We would perhaps use um, for the analysis, the software, you can have it for free. You can use it for any other activities you want. So we got this one at some point when you are doing some work somewhere and it's okay. It works well. 
So when we meet, perhaps I will be able to work with you throughout, but this is Stata as a software for analysis. It has some very few drop-down menus, as you can see up there. Very few, but very rich. All the graphics are right there. All the statistics are there. So I thought it was, so it's gonna be, it's fair if we would also have an, a way in which we can as well uh, interact with statistical software because these statistics, we cannot be just computing from week one to the end. We have some bit of theory and and, um, and, and also some application thing. So you'll notice that this has a few, uh, uh, this is a state interface. It has a few uh, windows in here. These are windows. I think I can identify four of them in the in Stata 11. Other versions have five windows. The first window is this one, which has these details. It's called the results window. Results window where you say where all the results you execute or you do appear. So if you run a, an hypothesis testing, the results will come here. When you do a regression model, the results come here. This is the results window. Down here, we have what they call a command window. So Stata uses commands as well. So we'll be putting some, you'll be instructing Stata to do some, some things in here. So, so that is our commands window. Then we have a variables window here. So where we'll be loading all the variables of our interest from your a research. When you have loaded everything, you have, they, they will be appearing here as the variable names and their labels and the types and the formats. You'll be see, you'll be see, you'll see some of them when you start loading data here. There's a command, a review command window here. It's called review command window, where all the commands you type here are automatically projected there as well. It saves all the commands for you. So there's uh, someone you say, where is the uh, Excel interface for this? It's somewhere here, it's called the data editor. There's a data editor there where you can manually input your uh, data. If I if I tap it once, then you can see it's more of a spreadsheet. So you can have your variables, everything data ended here. But I would prefer that you enter your data in Excel or yeah, before you don't do it manually here at times. It's a bit laborious. You rather do it in Excel and then you, you import into, into Stata. Yeah. So we will talk about this when the time comes, but for you, some of us would want to interact with it. Uh, Stata comes with also some data set inbuilt. If you go to file, uh, example data sets, these data sets which come with, a, with this software and you click it once, there are quite a number of them. So you can tick on the example that it comes with the, with the Stata. So these are the are almost 12 or so on different things. You can just pick on one of them. If you want to use that data set, you can let me take this one, NLS 99, I pick it, you just click use and then you close. You can see the data is right here. So you can have data already, which is in, in data and then you can now start working on it. Interestingly, whatever you clicked on, they are in the editor. Because when you click on editor, all, the, all those data sets are here. So we might not even struggle looking for data. We can work with the ones that are here. But I will also encourage you learn how to load your own and we run through. So this is part of the uh, techniques that we shall use, especially as we go to the next phase. So for me, if we move to hypothesis testing and then we do correlation and regression, then uh, with the software here, we'll be okay. Ah, yeah. So your data set has only three something. What is that? Three something. Okay. Ah, I didn't, I didn't. Yes. Yeah. When you are uploading this data, the, this uh, software is able to do for you diagram and maybe histogram or something like right that. Right here. As long as the data is there, mm -hmm. you go to the graphics. They are all here. Mm -hmm. Two edge graph, pie chart, histograms, all this. They are all there. Uh, so we'll, it will be interesting that you will have time also to play around with the same. So I use this data. You can use another one. Um, 
excuse me, Doctor, I have seen you yes. have twelve. Twelve. I only have three. Did you pick this variable? This which which one did you pick? Uh, did yeah, you pick that's the same? One. Yeah. The examples here. Example yeah, they're the just. Yours has three or I had picked this one called NLS eighty-eight. But there you can pick any. Okay. The, yeah, it, it was just to to demonstrate. Eh? Mm. Yeah, now yes, I may not have the you know, I'm also limited in some way. The Apple, the MacBook. Unless now you need one which is compatible, but but I may not have a solution for that as at the moment, because this one is only compatible with the Windows computers. Um, you can, you can come to our IT people can help you navigate that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So perhaps I what I don't know is that the I don't know if they have the data. The IT right here, I think they have they have SPSS. But I noticed that we are most of us are not in Nairobi because we are all over. For the for the for, for the one in IT, you have to just come in person, and uh, you can be able to. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, someone can give you. Some people can give you options in here. I can see. Uh, yeah, which has already have some solution there, but we don't know how how accessible the other one. Let, let's keep trying. Try to source the Mac to this one, see if it works. The only thing it will, it will give you maybe a, a higher, a latest version, which I think I also don't have access to at the moment. Yeah, but re remember it is just for demonstration and illustration. It This one does what you intend to do. It does the, the, the things that you want to do, including the all the, th the things in the cons outline. We can handle in the Stata 11. Mm. Okay, uh, so I want to propose that uh, you have the software, tried a few things in here. Next week we meet, uh, we see what we can do. Then I'll give you a time to go and do some group work on the side as you progress. We want to end, I want to propose that we end here for today. Any any I second. Any second. Thank you for seconding. <laughs> Good. Now we you also you have some some things to do. Uh from this week going forward, we shall we can re we'll reduce on the computations manually. We now go into a bit of theory and practice. Obadia, you want to second? Hang on, before I second you, there is something that I wish to inquire from you. Yes, yes. Yeah, if someone was to meet you physically, which day would you propose and uh, what specific time and where? Mm, let's let's let you let's do this eh? for for the meeting. I know most of the uh, some most of the Thursday was on Friday, if there's no, if you don't have an activity like defenses or a meeting, you are likely to meet with me. But I suggest you can, uh, we can organize, you drop me a call. Um, we have, I'm very flexible. We can arrange for that. Thank yeah, you. But, uh, no, yeah, but no, yeah. So next, but except next week, eh? except next week. Yes. Thank you. We can now proceed as Nyawita has proposed. I wish you a lovely week and enjoy. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Sana. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. What when you float? What when you float? Thank you, Apa. I have noted. Taslin, I will believe. Taslin, what are you doing, Apa? Chris, we're careful, I'm a flood.
Hata <laughs> hata Othello leo alikuwa amenyamaza. Ki unajua hapa leo kuna shida. <laughs> Good night baby. Ni mko jamiti. Hakuna na. Kokia sana. Okay, okay, bye everyone. See you around. Enjoy your evening and see you next week. <laughs> bye too. Thank you.